All right, so we have an issue with the uh, homework box. People are telling me that our homework box no longer has a, uh, we no longer, oh, you can't hear, but I think it's still, yeah. So can you hear me now? Yeah? Does that work? Does this? You can actually hear in the class now. All right. Um, okay, so you have a homework that's due today, but I guess I'm being told from all sorts of sources that somehow the 245 box is gone. Um, and so what you need to do is either hand me your homework right now in lecture or turn your homework into my office. Just slip it under my door until we can figure out what's going on with the homework boxes uh, in the courtyard. We should have a box, but you're telling me that it got removed, huh? Okay. Um, so what I've done was I have, I mean, Henry just told me this about 10 minutes before lecture by email, so I sent an email off to the department to try to understand what's going on. They sent an email to someone else, and so hopefully this gets sorted out. We end up with a homework box, but I think it's good information that 142 doesn't require one. And so why are they getting a box and our box is going away? I don't know what's going on, guys, but we'll figure this out. So just turn your homework into me or put it under my door tonight at 7 p.m. when I guess it's due. I won't mention all the <laughs> realities of when it's going to get picked up. Um, okay, so homework three is going to be online very soon. This is going to be something that has layout. You're going to have to read a full-blown process flow and come up with cross-sections, answer a number of questions about that. That's not yet online, but that's going to be online very soon. This is one of these homeworks that you got to get everything right, otherwise you can really screw people up. So we're doing some last-minute corrections on it. That, it. It's going to be due next Thursday, actually. It's not that long, uh, but it'll be due next Thursday, which is a week and a half from now, okay? A little less than a week and a half. Um, no lecture this Thursday again. Uh, I had different information. This is new information now. Okay, so the, the makeup lecture originally was going to be in this room next to us, uh, but that room is not screencast capable, and they have located a room that is screencast capable, but that's in LeConte. So to LeConte, the physics building near the Campanile. Uh, we're going to have the lecture there this coming Friday. Uh, we'll start at 3. I might go till 5, just because it's some extra time for us to catch up on the schedule and that sort of thing. Um, but that's when our makeup lecture is going to be. Either you can make it or you can't. If you can't, it is being screencast, so you'll be able to at least watch the movie or something on that. Okay? So this is when the makeup lecture will be for the lecture we will miss this coming Thursday. Any questions about this? Yes. Did you hear the suggestion from this side of the room? <laughs> he said you could turn it in early, which is a good option, actually. Um, I'd like to keep it on Thursday. Uh, when are you going to your conference? Is it? Uh, next Tuesday. Oh, next Tuesday. Oh, so even Tuesday. Even early wouldn't have worked. Uh, Monday is early, actually. That would have worked. Um, no, we've got to keep it on Thursday because we need to keep a schedule of homeworks or so. Uh, but for your case, right, it's all electronic these days. You can just email your homework to uh, Henry or me. You can work on it during the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get it done. Let's talk about this offline. This is not, yeah, I don't want to make policy here <laughs> when everyone is watching, right? So let's talk about this offline and figure out what to do. Um, any questions logistically about anything? Okay, again, I'm, I'm leaving tonight, so there'll be no office hours tomorrow and no lecture on Thursday, but make-up lecture on Friday. Okay? Um, all right, so today what we're going to do, we've been going through polysilicon surface micromachining, and we're essentially going through um, this module that you have online. 
And looks like I'm going to have to uh, do what I have not done yet, which is calibrate this. So hold on for a second. You know this drill. Uh, okay, so we're working through this uh, module on surface micromachining, and we sort of went through these here. So we're, we're now talking about stiction, and so this is a phenomenon that uh, you know you've run through the whole process that we went through. You finally release the thing in hydrofluoric acid, and now you dip it in DI water to try to remove all the acid, and uh, you take it out and you dry it. Okay, but what you find is after you dry it, the long beams are stuck to the surface. The short beams are not. And so this tells you that there's some kind of force holding these beams down. And I gave you the whole story of how we didn't know about stiction in the beginning. So we, we kept running the process, thinking we'd done something wrong with the process. But the process was perfectly good. We were wasting our time continuously running the process. What was really happening was the structures were released but they were stuck to the substrate because of this water-based capillary force that we talked about. And so I talked about how strong this force can be. If you're familiar with microscope slides, you put them together, you try to pull them apart, almost impossible to pull them apart, uh, directly apart with a normal force. If you do a shear force, you can get them apart. But a normal force, very difficult to get them apart. It's a very strong force holding these things together, and that's what's holding these micromechanical structures down to the substrate here. Um, so we want to understand these forces here, and we want to understand, first of all, what dictates this phenomenon. Why is it uh, that these structures come down? And more importantly, is there a way we can prevent this from happening? Because right? if we can't prevent this from happening, that's a lot of products based on this technology that will go nowhere, because right? everything will have failed. Um, Incidentally, that's a good lesson for you, this, this thing about stiction and running the process over again. If you're doing fabrication in the lab, and you, uh, this is amazing, I see so many people do this. They finish their process, and they look at their structures, and they spend an hour testing, and they say, oh, not going to work. i to go back in and process again, right? And processing again means spending two or three weeks, maybe a month, running the whole process again. Right? I'm just amazed at how fast people will give up on the devices they've made, right? test it for just an hour or two, conclude that they will never work, and go back in and process again. Never do that. Okay? Spend at least a week trying to test your devices. Even if you think there's no way they're going to work, spend at least a week because you don't want to go back into the lab running a month-long process uh, just to run into the same issue because you may not know what was wrong with these devices, right? Stiction could have been the problem, or there could be some problem with your measurement system or something, but never finish a process, test for only an hour or two, or even a day, and declare it dead, okay? There's always things you can do after running a process to try to recover your devices. Um, all right, so let's talk about, so we talked about this, that, that this is related to uh, the type of liquid that you have, the type of surfaces that the liquid is attached to, uh, just the, the, the uh, air or the uh, gas to liquid environment that you have. And all of these things come together uh, to create surface tensions that then determine what this contact angle of this liquid is uh, to the surface. So there's a definition of contact angle, sort of measured from inside of the liquid uh, to the tangent uh, to the uh, point, the contact point right here. And so this is an example of a hydrophobic case where the liquid doesn't like the surface. So you see it's trying to get away with it. It's trying to minimize the surface area that it's in contact with the surface. And then you have a hydrophilic case where the liquid loves the surface. And so it comes down and tries to wet the surface as much as possible. Okay, so obviously there's many different cases here. And it turns out that the hydrophilic case is the case where your device is pancaked down to the surface. The hydrophobic case, uh, where the liquid doesn't like the surfaces, is a case where you will not get stiction. Okay, so right away, just from this understanding, you sort of can tell 
if I want to prevent stiction of devices, I have to make sure that the liquids and surfaces uh, that are around together with air, assuming everything's operating in air, uh, are such that the surface tensions uh, create a contact angle that's greater than 90 degrees. Okay? When the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees, that's your hydrophobic situation. Water doesn't want to coat these different surfaces. Okay? So that's a hand-waving qualitative thing. Let's now take a look at this in more detail here. Whoops. To escape from this. Okay, and let's take a little bit of time with this because this is an important topic. And let's go back to this mode of presentation. So last time we were going through the uh, um, the module. Okay, but now let's talk about, say, microstructure stiction in more detail. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is surface tension. So what is surface tension? Because this has a lot to do with what's going on here. So first of all, over, over a surface, tension is going to be a force per unit area. Okay, but how are these forces generated? These forces per unit area are sort of contort uh, the surface of a liquid into the shape that it takes on. The shape a liquid takes on is happening because of surface tensions uh, on that liquid. And so why might this be happening? Well, one reason could be Say if this is your liquid surface right here. And consider the molecules that are in the liquid and consider the molecules that are sort of at the edge of the liquid here. So let's take one that's inside the liquid, say right here. Okay, so there's one molecule in the liquid. And so what's happening to this molecule? It's sort of surrounded by other molecules around it and maybe it's experiencing some forces from those other molecules. And those forces perhaps are attractive. So if it's receiving attractive forces from all the molecules around it, then right, it's going to have a force in this direction. It's going to have an equal and opposite force probably in that direction, and so on and so forth. It's just surrounded by other molecules that are imposing forces on it. Okay, so these are uh, attractive forces from uh, neighbors, all of these things here. from neighboring molecules, right? And so this molecule under the liquid surface, and so let me just make that clear. This is a molecule under the liquid surface. It's experiencing all of these attractive forces. It's pulled in all directions. So obviously, you could say that the net force on this is zero, okay? Okay, so that molecule sits there and it's, it's got neighbors that are applying forces to it, in this case attractive forces. It's zero, of course. What about the molecule that's right up at the surface? Okay, well this molecule also has neighbors, right? It's got neighbors that are pulling in opposite directions, but now it's got neighbors that are pulling in directions that are not balanced out by neighbors on the other side. Okay, so the molecules of the surface are very different from the molecules in, in the, in below the surface, right? They're experiencing different forces here. And so let me be complete about this and just say this is a molecule at the liquid surface. And so, in this case, it's experiencing, so this molecule experiences a net inward force.
Okay? And that's going to be the case for all the other molecules on the surface too, right? I'm going to have many other molecules here. They're all pretty much receiving this net inward force, right? And so that net inward force, right, it's got to be balanced by something. If this thing is in equilibrium, right, all of this has to be balanced out. And so eventually all, right, all of this is balanced out by the liquid's resistance to compression. Right? So you have all these forces, but you know it's equilibrium. Nothing is moving. So the forces are balanced out by liquids resistance to compression. So obviously all of these problems can be modeled by just a force balance problem, right? A statics type problem that you see in mechanical engineering all the time. Uh, but in the end, right, what happens, the overall result of all of this, right, the liquid will try to find its lowest energy state, right? And so in this case, it'll squeeze itself. Right, because it wants to create as little surface as possible, right? It's the surface where there's a lot of energy, where you don't have a balance of forces around the different molecules. So the, the liquid squeezes uh, to achieve essentially the smallest surface area. Okay, which corresponds in this case to the smallest energy state. Okay, and so how does this liquid take on the curvature that it does? Well, again, it's all a balance of forces that we're looking at. And so let's talk about uh, surface curvature and pressure now. Right, I may start out with a surface that's perfectly flat. So here's my surface here, and so in this case I'm drawing a surface where there's no pressure difference across this surface. So the pressure at the top is the same as the pressure at the bottom for this surface, right? And so, right, if this is the case, then the surface is flat. What forces this surface to start curving, right, as we're seeing liquids to happen, is there's a pressure difference between the different sides of this surface, right? And so if I apply a pressure difference to this, um, I'm going to end up with the following. So upon introduction, of a differential pressure, uh, what's going to happen? So I apply pressure on one side. You sort of know what's going to happen, right? If this thing is being held down somehow on its sides by the, the, the contact that it has with the surface there, right? This thing is going to contort, right? It's going to go into a curve here. And it's going to go into a curve such that it generates a net force that counteracts the pressure that's trying to push it in one direction. Pressure pushes in one direction. It creates a force through tensions that push in another direction, okay? And it can all be equated out using trigonometry, just geometry here. So here's the contorted uh, surface. So maybe now it's contorted like this. And it goes across here, maybe like this. And I guess I can have this, just to show you that this is all perfectly contorted like that. Whoops, that should be a dotted line. Okay, so this, this thing is now contorted in different directions and we can model this whole thing. So 
let me just say surface uh, uh, curves or contorts <coughs> to generate a net normal force to maintain equilibrium against the applied pressure. Okay, so in this case, I'm applying pressure from the bottom, right? That's why it's contorting like this. And so this thing is now bending this way. And so what, what's happening is you're creating a tension force over the surface of this. Okay, and I could say that one of my tension forces is right here. You can call that, say, F sub F for the front tension force. And I have another tension force that's back here that's a back tension force. And again, a tension force is just a surface force on this. Right? So it's a, in this case, it's, it's a force uh, per unit area over all of this here. Or sorry, a, a force per length in this case, right? Because we're going to want to look at this in a one dimensional type thing. So tension is force per, per length, not area. I think I said area in the one time before on this, right? So it's first force per unit uh, length here. And I've got all these different forces, right? There's going to be one acting in this direction, too which I'll call F sub L, one acting in this direction, two, uh, which is F sub R. So that's front, back, right, left, is how I'm uh, giving these uh, subscripts there. It turns out that the shape that the liquid takes is sort of decided by the Young and Laplace equation, which is something you can learn if you take courses on fluids or not. I'm not going to explain where it comes from or so. These are things that you'll get in other courses uh, I guess a lot of them in mechanical engineering. Uh, but it's the Young and Laplace equation that decides how this thing will contort. Uh, and to define this equation, let me define a couple things. So if I take this right here, you can see that this is sort of taking uh, what looks to be a circle. right? And so it's going to have a radius. So it's curved. Any curved thing right, is, is part of a circle, you could say. And so you can give it a radius of curvature, a radius that corresponds to that amount of curvature that you have in that circle. Okay? And so I can uh, extend down here uh, like this. So I could sort of pull this out like this, and maybe this is, you know, this defines that radius there. And so I can define an angle here, say delta theta sub x there. And this then would be the radius associated with that with this amount of curvature. And so that r sub x would be the radius of curvature for this curve right here. Okay? And you know, I could use all the different trigonometric relationships with this too. If I want this distance, right, that distance I could say is just this rx times that uh, angle, which I'm calling delta theta of x. Right? So that's along the x axis. I can do a similar thing here say along the y-axis, so I have a radius of curvature right here. Again, a delta theta sub y. Radius of curvature is going to be this, r sub y. And I can also sort of define this length across here as being uh, r sub y times delta theta sub y. Okay, And so in all of these things, you know, the values they take on is going to be dictated by the Young-Laplace equation. So let me write that equation now. Very simple equation. So it takes the pressure dis uh, difference, which is delta P, across these one, uh, the, the two sides of the surface here. And it says that's equal to a surface tension parameter, uh, gamma times 1 over the radius of curvature for these two different dimensions that we're looking at right now. Okay? And so let me define all of these things here. So this is where delta P is the pressure difference across this uh, membrane. Gamma is the surface tension with 
which is a force per unit length, and then Rx and R sub y, these, like I said, are the radii of curvature. Okay, this is just showing it in the 2D thing. We're usually going to be concerned mainly about a 1D type problem uh, in this class for the types of problems we're looking at, which will be simplified problems. But again, this Young-Laplace equation it basically governs the shape. of the liquid, okay? And you can read text on this sort of thing. It gets kind of hairy. I don't want to get into all the details. I'm really just trying to get to a point where you can functionally determine whether something is going to stay up or whether it's going to stick because of the liquid that's underneath it that's trying to dry up. Um, okay, and so let me define one more thing that we're going to need in order to model this problem. And then we already talked about that. That's the contact angle. We talked a little bit about this already. This is dictated uh, by basically a balance of the surface tensions. Okay, so this is really a property that's dependent on the interface between different materials. So to define a contact angle, you have to give the material set uh, that you're working with here. So let me write this down. So um, really a property dependent on uh, the interface between the different materials. Okay, so let's say, just take an example here, because that's kind of cryptic without an example associated with it. But let's take the example of a hydrophilic uh, droplet. Okay, so if I have a hydrophilic droplet, you also you already know it's hydrophilic, so it loves the substrate, it loves the surface. And so if I were to draw this droplet, it's going to have a contact angle that's going to be less than 90 degrees, so maybe the droplet will look like this. Okay? So there's my hydrophilic droplet, and so I could, you know, take a dotted line here that's sort of tangent uh, with the curvature of this droplet at this contact point here. That's going to determine for me my contact angle theta sub c. But around this contact angle, there's all sorts of different things. So I have a bunch of different tensions uh, between different media here. Okay, so for example, I can define right here. Um, probably best to do it in a different color. So I can define right here uh, what I'll call f sub l a. Okay, this is going to be the liquid air surface tension force. Okay, and again, theta sub c is contact angle. Okay, but that's not where it ends, right? I have two other surfaces that are defined, right, that are uh, touching one another, they have uh, an interface between them. So I have one surface here that is right between the liquid and the solid. So I'm assuming everything below all of this is a solid here. So I'm also going to have a force here that's going to be a tension force that I can call FLS, and that is the liquid-solid interface. tension force. And by the same token, I can define another force over here that's between the air and the solid here. So that's FSA. This is the uh, solid air 
uh, surface tension force. Okay, and so in all of this, you could see all of this is also in equilibrium too, right? So if it's in equilibrium, right, this force going up this way is going to create a horizontal vector, and it's going to create a vertical vector. And if this is in equilibrium, nothing could be moving, right? It's a statics problem. So there has to be some force that holds everything in place, at least in the vertical direction, and that's my F sub A here. That is my adhesion force. So I have all of these different forces that I've defined right here. And in order for this to be a droplet that stays in place, right, that is in equilibrium, uh, all these forces need to cancel. All right, so again, I'm talking about equilibrium. It's a statics problem. So if it's equilibrium, then the horizontal forces cancel and the vertical forces. I have to cancel, and of course my analysis is pretty much being done at the contact point. So I'll just say explicitly, at the contact point, right, which is this point right there. Okay? Um, and so this makes it mathematically tractable. Now I can write all sorts of expressions, right? If all my vertical forces need to cancel, uh, then this adhesion force that I have, F sub A, that has to be equal to the component of the liquid air surface tension force that's in the vertical direction. And that component is FLA times the sine of theta sub C. So you see where that contact angle is coming into these equations. And likewise, I have to write a similar equation for the lateral direction, where the solid air surface tension force has to be equal to the liquid solid surface tension force plus the liquid air surface tension force, but this time times the cosine of theta sub c. Right? So what you're seeing here is that there's a relationship between all the surface tensions and the contact angle. And in fact, the contact angle then captures a lot of information about all the different surface tensions. This means you don't need to know all these surface tensions. You really only need to know one of them and the contact angle, and then you have a complete problem here. Okay, so what do I mean? I, I guess I have all these enforces here, and so those are surface tension forces. Force, of course, is proportional to the surface tension, so I can write this in terms of surface tensions, uh, which, for which I used the symbol gamma before. Right? I'm just changing the F's to gammas here. And uh, that's an important relationship we'll use. And in basically saying there's a relationship uh, between surface tensions and it can be captured by the contact angle. Okay, so an expression, so, so in our analysis, what we really need to know is one of the surface tensions, and usually we're going to want to know the liquid air surface tension, and then we're going to want, want to know the contact angle for that uh, number of materials that we're playing with. Okay, so now let's take an actual practical problem. All I've been doing now is building up to the practical problem, and so let's do that now. Let's take an example here uh, where we have two plates with a meniscus of liquid between them. And what we want to know is how much force is that liquid exerting on these two plates to pull them together, okay? And so let's do that example. Example. Two plates, all right? So here's my top plate. Is a bottom plate. And 
and I've dried off all the liquid around these things except there's still liquid that remains between these and so here is the liquid interface. You notice I'm drawing the liquid as something that uh, has a concave shape which means that its contact angle is going to be less than 90 degrees uh, which means it's going to make an attractive force on these two plates. Okay, so let me identify everything. So this is uh, let me move some things too. Okay, I won't move anything. This is my top plate. That's the bottom plate. This, of course, is a liquid in here. And you know, you can see this is where all the water is or whatever liquid it is. This is the wetted area all the way across here. I'm going to call this A. And A is going to be the wetted area. I guess it's an area, right? I'm sort of drawing it as a line across this, but that's sort of what defines the area. This, this thing has some depth, right, into the page here. Um, and so with this, I can also define contact angles, but to do that, let me draw a better I'll give it one more shot, and if I can't do a good one, we'll just work with what I can make. Okay, so that's a little bit better, right? So contact angle for this, there's my theta sub c. Contact angle that this water is making with the surfaces that we care about. And again, usually that contact angle is something we'll be able to look up. Okay, so that's going to be something that the chemist, physicist, if you look in the handbook of physics and chemistry, you'll find contact angles for many different types of uh, material and liquid interfaces uh, and gas interfaces. And so what do we want to do? So we know that what's going to happen here is that this is actually going to exert a force here. It's got a, it's got a surface tension force, right? And that surface tension force is, has a component that's going in the vertical direction, right? Which tells you that this whole thing wants to collapse, right? You've got a force that's pulling this whole thing together to make it collapse. Uh, but we're going to try to write an equation for this force here, which is force F that I'm applying, that's necessary to prevent this thing from collapsing. Okay? And so let me give a couple more dimensions on all this. Let's say that the distance between these plates that we're starting with, with this meniscus here, is G. Okay? And so let me now employ that Laplace equation. that we studied briefly there. And let me just rewrite it here. So the pressure difference here on the liquid air interface, right? so this is between liquid and air, there's a pressure difference across that, is going to be equal, just like the Laplace equation that I wrote last time, to the liquid air surface tension. So that surface tension at the liquid air interface divided by R, which is the radius of curvature of the meniscus. Well, I'll just say I have the liquid here. Okay, and so what is that radius of curvature? Well, I can, uh, I can sort of draw a circle around this here. The radius of curvature of this circle, if you can believe it's a circle, I suppose. Right? So there's that circle, right? And I have a radius that's going from here to there, right? That's going to be R. Okay? And you can see that the radius of curvature can be defined in, in two ways, right? In this case, the liquid is concave. It could also be convex, right? Where it's sort of going out in this direction here. And so the way that we handle that is that if it's, if it's convex, then we make the radius of curvature negative. Okay, so this radius of curvature is negative if convex. 
Okay, so for this problem, it's going to be negative because we have a convex, and it's negative for the case where you have hydrophilic uh, liquid that's going to collapse the whole thing together. Right, so this thing wants to collapse in a big way. And what we're interested in is how much force is involved with trying to shove those two plates together. Okay, because usually it's going to be a force balance type problem. But let me finish this first. So this is the pressure difference at the liquid air interface. And now we have all the equations we need. Now it's just a little bit of geometry, right? We assume we're given this surface tension because we know the liquid air that we're dealing with, right? We assume that we know the contact angle because we know the liquid, the air, and the solids that we're dealing with, right? This could be polysilicon or something that we normally make our MEM structures out of, okay? So we know all those constants, this, this gamma. We need this R here. Okay, and we want to find out what this pressure difference is because this pressure difference equals force, right? That pressure is a force that's really pulling everything together here. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. But first of all, just from the geometry of this, you can do the easy trigonometry. You can write down that the radius of curvature is going to be G over 2, where G again is this gap space. And so you're sort of taking you know, half of that there and that's your g over 2. Okay, so that's g over 2 divided by what will end up being the cosine of your contact angle theta sub c. Okay, and that's just a little trigonometry I'll let you do by yourself. This, of course, is a convex thing, so I have to put a minus sign in front of that, and that then becomes my radius of curvature, which I'm then just going to feed it into this expression here, but first I'm going to convert this to a force. So the force that I want to apply to pull these apart Right? This pressure is basically something that's pulling them together. Right, uh, So the force I want to apply is going to be the negative of this. So the force is equal to minus this delta P LA times the total area over which all that pressure is occurring Right, to convert it to a force. And so this then ends up being 2 times the wetted area times gamma LA, the surface tension, times the cosine of the contact angle divided by the gap. Okay, so this is an expression here for the force that I have to apply to keep these plates apart. So this is the force uh, needed to keep the plates apart. Okay, if that force is positive, so positive force means negative Laplace pressure. Okay, which means I'm applying a force to keep these things from going apart. Why do I do it this way? Because in general, for these problems, there's going to be some force. Uh, that is keeping these plates apart. So in a MEMS structure, what's really happening? So here's what you would have usually in a MEMS case. So you would have your substrate, you would have your MEMS anchor, and maybe this whole thing is like a cantilever like this. Right? And so you're going to end up, maybe you have some big square block here. So the top view of this thing may look something like this. Right? And so you then have water that's doing this, OK? And so you know that what this water is doing, right? It's trying to put a force that's going to bring all of this together. But you also have a force here that's due to this spring, right? The spring is going to have some stiffness, K. And so the force that you're pulling back here is going to be k times whatever that distance is, which is g, right? And so what happens? If, if, if this distance is g, uh, then the total amount of force is going to be 0. But as this thing starts bending, right, so this thing is going to start bending here, because this pressure 
right, is pulling the thing together so this thing starts to bend. Right? And so what's happening as this is bending? Well, this gap goes to G prime, which is less than G. Okay? That's trouble, right? Because if you look on this side, that G is sitting right there. And uh, as that G gets smaller, the force that's going to be trying to pull those two plates together gets worse and worse. Okay? So that's not good for you. But you also see that as that G gets smaller than the delta G, starts getting bigger. And this force really goes as K times delta G. Okay, so you've got two forces that are fighting each other. You've got one force from the capillary force, from the liquid that's trying to shove the thing together. You've got the other force from the stiffness that's trying to keep it up. One of them is going to win. Okay, it's an unstable situation. Or it could be stable. If, if, the, if the spring force wins, it's stable. Okay? But if the liquid force wins, the capillary forces from the liquid wins, the whole thing collapses. Okay? And so that's what happens in these stiction type problems. You're trying to dry the thing, but you have that meniscus there, and you have a situation where your gap is too small, or your area is too big, or your contact angle is not what it needs to be. Uh, such that the whole thing just pancakes down, and then you have a structure that's just stuck to the substrate, and your device, your product, whatever it is, won't work. All right? And so what's instructive out of all of this, uh, you're actually going to get a homework problem that is going to go through a lot of details on this. But what's instructive is to look at this equation here, and just from this equation, figure out uh, what's important to control in order to prevent stiction. Okay, so let's just make some remarks here. And basically the remark that I want to make is to prevent stiction. What do you want to do? Well, straight from this equation, right, the radius, first of all, this thing depends on a bunch of things, right? It depends on the radius A, and so what you can do is reduce A. Sorry, not the radius, the area A. Right? So what you could do is reduce A, the wetted area. Right? So this example above, right, you really don't want this plate to be so big if you can avoid it. Right? Unfortunately, you saw the accelerometers. Right? The way accelerometers work, you have to have a lot of mass. If you don't have a lot of thickness of that plate, you get a lot of that mass by making it nice and wide, and that's just asking for stiction. Okay, so that's why in the beginning accelerometers were such a difficult product to make. When analog devices was trying to make this product, especially surface micro machine ones, that was their biggest problem, period. It was stiction. And so people were watching them, you know, they had demonstrated some accelerometers, and people were asking, well, how come they're not up at high volume production? Why is it taking so long? What's What's the problem here? That's what the problem was. It was they could fab devices, you know, a certain percentage of them would go unstuck, uh, but a lot of them were stuck initially. And uh, even after you released them and they weren't stuck initially, if moisture condensed on the thing, right, if you didn't have a good enough package and it created uh, uh, liquid between the, the, the plate and, and the substrate, down it goes. Okay, so not only failed immediately after uh, fabrication, but even you know, during operation, there was a possibility that it could fail. So it's these types of things that take a long time for these products here. So one of the things was you know, they had to get the stress correct to prevent things from bending up, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will talk about. But once they figured out that problem, this new problem comes in, stiction, right, where everything's just stuck to the substrate. Now they sell accelerometers for very cheap. And they sell gyros and all of these things, gigantic structures. Uh, so they figured out how to defeat stiction. Okay? And part of it is here. Well, well, for this, you can't do a whole lot for an accelerometer, for the area here. But what other things do we have in this equation uh, that we can use to help ourselves? And uh, one of them is, that, uh, is, is just the type of uh, liquids that we have here, right? Just the, the liquid air interface that we have. Uh, to make that surface tension small. 
right? So you can reduce gamma LA. Okay, how do you do this? You do this by choose, choosing the right liquids. And I can say solids. while you're doing these releases. I could even say gas, too. It turns out that one of the solutions tries to choose all of these things uh, that we'll talk about in just a second here. But the other thing is to reduce LA. Another thing you can do, obviously, from here is make the gap large. Okay? The larger you can make that gap, the smaller this force. Okay, in surface micromachining, it's not that easy to make gaps very large, uh, but in bulk micromachining or in technologies where you can have very thick films, you can make that gap a lot larger. And it turns out that's one of the solutions they're using. Right? So if you look at a lot of these accelerometers, they're, they're not just surface micromachine. They're actually using very, I mean, they are surface micromachine, but they're using very thick layers now. Either that's a, a part of the silicon. So they're actually using SOI. We have a very thick silicon layer. And some of them are actually growing thick silicon as well, or thick polysilicon as well. Okay, but the thicker you go, uh, that generally means the larger the gap spacing you can get. The thicker you can go also means you can make K large. So increase K, increase the stiffness. That basically means make things thicker. And K, to remind you, is that stiffness. Right? So help the force that's acting against the stiction. Okay, that's another thing that you can try to do. And finally, this is related to the surface tension thing, is it make your contact angle greater than 90 degrees. Okay, so that also goes to choosing the right type of liquid, solids, gases around this system. Okay, so you can see just from this equation, there's a lot of things you can try to do to prevent stiction. And these are the things that people have been focusing on, and I'm about to go through all these different methods. Yes? It's the area of this whole, uh, it's not just that area, it's, it's this whole interface area here. Okay, So that, there's a multiple of forces coming. Wherever you have liquid there, that's pulling down on the whole thing. Okay? So the whole thing is proportional to that area. Okay? So how big your structure is makes a big difference on this. Okay? Yes? So the area goes inwards? The area goes inwards? Yeah, so this is a cross section. Th this picture is a cross section. Right? So this plate goes into the page. Right? So this is, I guess, I mean, I'm indicating that as area, right? But it's really like that, right? It's really that area there. Okay? Any other questions? Yeah. It's the whole area, yeah. So it's basically the whole area that you start with. Because when you start with, it's the whole area, right? That's going to tell you what the biggest force is on that. Right? That's going to tell you whether that thing comes down or not. Okay? And so when that thing does come down, then everything, it's, it's a constantly changing problem, right? Because you start out with a certain gap, right? But then you end up, when all the water's gone from all the sides, right? Then you have these surface tension forces. And then the whole thing, it, it either comes down there or it doesn't. Okay? And so, but when it does come down, then that gap gets small and there's no returns, right? You're, you're down, you're, you're past the point of no return there. And so these are the problems you'll be doing. We'll, we'll have problems for you in homework. In fact, we have one in this upcoming homework where you have to do all of this. You have to look at the area, you have to look at the surface tension, the contact angle. You have to determine, well, I guess right now we won't make you determine the stiffnesses. Uh, but you, have to, you normally would have to determine the stiffnesses and then pit one against the other. You're basically solving... Uh, simultaneous equations to figure out where the solutions are. If the solutions are such that the gap is negative, then it's come down. Okay, but if the solutions are such that the gap is positive, then it's still up. Okay, and you'll be okay.
All right? Yes. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that right now, actually. So let's, let's talk about uh, methods for um, solving this problem that people have attempted here. Okay, so we know the problem. It's the liquid that's the problem. Contact angle is too small. Um, and so these are things in your notes, basically what I did, except I did a little more detail than this. Uh, but how can you avoid stiction? Okay, so one of the issues that you have is gap. Right? If the gap is too small, if you allow your gap to get too small, then you're going to have a very strong stiction force. And so one way people have attempted to reduce this force is to use dimples in your structures. And so that's what that is. That actually is a dimple. And so you can see that this structure cannot go down all the way. There's sort of a, a minimum gap that it can get to determined by this dimple. And that means that the stiction forces will be a lot smaller. Now, you will have a very large stiction force here because that will actually touch the substrate. Right? So you've got to make sure that the area of these dimples isn't so big. And usually, they're made as small as possible. Okay? Now, does this really help? It does help, but it doesn't really solve the stiction problem. So it does end up being the case that you know, no matter how small you make these areas, these things still stick and they stick right there. Right? Because right here, where this comes down, that gap goes to zero. Right? And so these things can still stick there, but the nice thing about these is for research purposes. In research, if it sticks just there instead of across the whole thing, you can come with a probe and pick this up pretty easily. Right? So you have a structure that, that's apparently stuck. It's not really stuck, it's on its dimple, but you come with a probe and you just pick it up right on a probe station. Obviously, this is not something you want to do with a product in industry. Right? <laughs> but in research, this was our initial solution. Uh, to all of this. And so that's why, actually, even in the layout, um, did I have the layout in this? I think I've deleted the layout from this version of the thing. But in your module, you have the layout. You see those little pink boxes in that layout, purple boxes? Those are the dimples. And those are exactly where we place the dimples on those structures to prevent, to try to prevent or help with stiction. Okay? Um, there are other things people have tried, like meniscus shaping features, like this thing here. You can sort of shape that meniscus there to try to make it a situation where it isn't as bad of a contact angle. So attempts like that can be made, but these sorts of things, they're not very good for design. Right? They force you to do things to your design that maybe you don't want to do. Okay? Um, so other solutions are just to avoid the liquid vapor meniscus form in, formation in the first place. Okay, so how do you do that? You get rid of all liquids. Okay, one way to do that is just to use solvents that sublimate. Right? So what's sublimation? That's when something goes directly from a solid phase to a gaseous phase. Okay, so there were tricks like this that were using uh, other types of alcohols, for example, that you can freeze. Right? And then when you put them up at, at, at room temperature or higher temperatures, uh, they don't first turn into a liquid. They go directly from solid to gas. And so those were cases, uh, th that was one solution to this problem. Uh, but it was not a very convenient solution, right? You had to freeze your structure. And it didn't always work, I suppose. Right? So you had to get it just right such that it sublimates, because sometimes it would form into a liquid. Uh, so it didn't always work. Um, other things you can do is use a vapor phase sacrificial layer etch. Okay, so why are you doing the sacrificial etch in a liquid? Right, because HF works. Well, does a gas work? Can you get a gaseous HF? And it turns out you can. So that's one solution also to prevent the sticking problem. Uh, some other things you can do is modify surfaces to change the meniscus shape from uh, concave, which is small contact angle, to convex, large contact angle. And so things like coating your structures, right? This is where you're engineering the materials that you're using. Right? So polysilicon may not be the best in terms of contact angle. But if you can coat your polysilicon with something like Teflon, right? so you know Teflon, right? You put a drop of water on Teflon, it's just going to sit there, right? You turn the Teflon over, that water's out of there, right? It doesn't want to wet that surface. Uh, so Teflon-like films, uh, hi other hydrophobic type things, self-assembled monolayers have been tried. Uh, and another, I, I guess one of the more successful methods has been supercritical CO2 drying. Okay, so what is supercritical CO2 drying? Uh, it's sort of a method, uh, well, it's exactly a method for releasing microstructures where, again, 
you don't have surface tensions present because when you dry this, you basically drive it, dry it in a supercritical region. <laughs> okay, so you all remember your phase diagrams, I'm sure, uh, from your uh, material science courses or wherever you saw phase diagrams, right? So you got diagrams where a particular material is a solid, a liquid, a gas, right? It's this, this interface where it's a liquid and a gas at the same time that you don't like, a liquid and a vapor at the same time that you don't like, right? Uh, so there's different regions, right? There are points where the solid can go directly to the vapor. Okay, but there's also a point out here that's the critical point. And past that critical point, this thing is neither a liquid, nor a solid, nor a vapor. Okay, which means it has no surface tensions. So you eliminate that surface tension problem. And so if you can sort of dry, quote, dry your device in this supercritical point here, the supercritical region, you're not going to get any sticking. Okay, so that's the whole concept behind these supercritical CO2 dryers. I guess, no, this is something that people have used in biology for a long time. So this is a way that they dried and cleaned their samples for a long time. And the MEMS guys just uh, figured out that, hey, maybe this is something that could be useful for drying micromechanical devices too. And so this was actually invented here at Berkeley. And so a sort of a, a uh, um, a collaboration, I think, between David Sohn and Roger Howe. David Sohn is in the chemical engineering department. Roger Howe was an EE. Um, and uh, a, a guy named Greg Mulhern was the guy who did a lot of the work for this. And I was one of the first users of this machine. Right? It wasn't a machine at the time. It was something Greg had to basically do the right finite element programs to make sure that the thing didn't explode. Right? Because when you're doing this, you're sort of putting this at a high pressure and temperature. Right? Look at the supercritical point. Right? The pressure is high, temperature is high. You're making a bomb, basically. Right? So you had to design this thing with the finite element code such that this thing doesn't blow up under those pressures and temperatures. So I remember using that thing. It was always a scary thing. Right? We're always making sure, OK, are all the screws in? Are they all tight enough? OK, let's turn it on and get out of here. But anyway, the thing worked. And so the process is like this. So the procedure is you first etch everything in HF. So it's a liquid solution. You rinse in DI water, but you don't allow it to dry. Okay, you basically transfer your wafer from the DI water to methanol first, where you could sort of replace the DI water with methanol. And then you could take the methanol, put that in the CO2 chamber for this thing, and the CO2 chamber would then replace the methanol with CO2. Okay, it would then take it to the pressure and temperature needed to get it to this supercritical region here. And uh, you no longer have a vapor or liquid in equilibrium. Right? And you can then just remove all the supercritical CO2 in that chamber. Everything is nice and dry. Take it back down in temperature and pressure. And you have a release device that's freestanding that does not stick. Okay? And so this does work. There's a company out there called Tusimus. There's other companies as well that now produce these in volume uh, that people buy. We have one of these in our uh, micro lab. I have one of these in my lab. Right? So very useful tools. And this is a great way to prevent sticking okay, from happening once you release. Does it prevent sticking from happening forever? No, it doesn't. So you may have released a device, but if you release that device and you leave it in this atmosphere out in the open, eventually it's going to get moisture. Since it's a tiny device and that gap is tiny, the moisture is going to be uh, abundant enough to connect the top and bottom, and that thing is going to come down. Okay, so it's also important to have very good packaging, hermetic packaging, that keeps all the moisture out. So you can do the supercritical CO2 drying, but then get it into a good package or get it into a good environment immediately. Otherwise, you'll find that your device isn't going to work anymore after a week or something. Okay? I don't know why I have this thing again here. Um, maybe as a, as a, just to say that there are some surfaces that are great, like flower surfaces, right? So on flower surfaces, right, these things ward water away. Nanograss, for example, as well. Right? Nanograss also has a very large contact angle with water. So one way to make hydrophobic surfaces is to put nanograss on them. And that's sort of what's happening on, on say, the, the, the leaf of a lotus flower. So uh, Other ways that you could do this. So this is sticking with the nanograss idea, but getting even smaller, say, at the molecular level. Uh, there was work done by Roya Maboudian, who's also here at UC Berkeley. Uh, 
you know, you can reduce stiction by tailoring surfaces so that you can increase the contact angle. And one way to do that is to put down self-assembled monolayers, what's called SAMs. So what, are the, what these are are uh, uh, sort of long molecules that will attach to the surface at one end. But then the other part of this looks like a piece of grass sticking up. And like I said, grassy type things create large contact angles. And so that's what this was doing. But this was a way to create grassy surfaces without having to you know, go through the trouble of growing nanograss, which is usually a high temperature type process. This process is all solution based. So you have a bunch of beakers uh, with solutions, and you stick your stuff in the solution. And you develop these uh, surfaces here. Uh, it worked. And you could see right here that it's able to, to you know, over silicon dioxide, you put this coating above it, it takes the contact angle to over 112 degrees, which is very good. Okay, the problem with this type of uh, process is you know, it's, it's, it's unclear how high a temperature it can survive. So you, ha you have an application that has to go to a higher temperature. Temperature goes high enough, you may lose these molecules off of the surface of your structures. The other thing is it didn't always work, I suppose. When you tried it, th there's some magic to making this work. Maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe just the people who tried it didn't have the right recipes. But at least in the heyday, people were trying this. And not everyone can get it to work. Okay, but I think probably in an industry type process, you can probably get it to work. This is one of those classic things, right, that basically says everyone um, has a great contribution to the MEMS field, right? So this is a chemical engineering contribution here, right? EEs wouldn't come up with this. Right? I don't think EMEs would either, right? This was great work by the chemies to figure out how to solve uh, a problem that was basically killing a lot of MEMS products here. Uh, other ways to do this, right? Again, if it's, uh, if it's liquid that's the problem, with that surface tension, then do a dry release. Okay, and there's many ways you can think of doing a dry release. One of them is vapor phase HF. So vapor phase HF, right, is where HF is not in a liquid format. It, it's, it's a gas. And you're flowing this gas uh, through your structures or so, and it's etching the oxide there and not attacking the, the silicon or whatever you made your structure out of. Um, it's advantageous because it's a gas, right? The gas can get through tiny gaps, but the issue is that it's not always completely dry. Okay? Moisture can still condense from this reaction, and if that happens, uh, then you can still get sticking even though you have a vapor phase HF system. And so we have a vapor phase H HF system, but unfortunately it's not the best system in the world, right? Because I don't think it has an alcohol content. So you have to add alcohol to keep the water out. Okay, and so better systems will add alcohol. There's people out there that make these systems, and we're actually looking to buy one of these systems uh, to do these types of dry releases here. But these work as long as you can keep the water out, and adding alcohol is one way to do it. Um, there's other ways to do dry releases. So one way that people were looking at, we're actually doing something what's shown here. Uh, so they're actually using a, uh, a resist. Well, no, in this case, they have oxide here, which they release. Uh, but all the structure is sort of held up by these polymer columns. And then you can go in with an O2 plasma and just etch away these polymer col columns. So in the end, right, you're sort of reducing the area here. You're raising the stiffness of this. That sort of raises uh, the force necessary to pull this down. So you get rid of stiction uh, by geometric uh, design here. Okay, This doesn't come down. Um, and then to release this finally, these polymer pedestals that held everything up while it was drying can then be removed with an O2 plasma. Okay, so this is one way to do it. There are some drawbacks with this here is that if the polymer is not completely removed, uh, then right, it's kind of like glue almost, right? It, it, if your structure comes down, there's still polymer there, it can make your structure stick itself. Okay, so it's not a perfect process either. Uh, vapor phase HF is pretty good. Vapor phase HF, supercritical CO2 drying, those are good ways to solve this problem. Yes? No. No, there's no problems with that. With vapor phase HF, you just take your structure, it's got oxide around it, you put it in the vapor phase HF chamber, it starts working. Now, our chamber is not very good. You'll find out if you ever use it. But there's a lot of complaints about it, so we do want to replace it with something better. And a lot of people don't really use it because it doesn't really work the way that it's supposed to. 
Um, OK, so let's move on to other issues with surface micromachining. So all that time we just spent on stiction, right, which is one of the issues with surface micromachining, and with all micromachining in general. But it's such an important issue that I spent that much time on it. OK, but let's move on to other issues. And so the other one that's also very important is residual stress. OK, so what is residual stress? So after release, uh, if you haven't designed your microstructure well, or even if you've designed it well, but your process is not under control, uh, structures could buckle, which is what's shown right here. So these are supposed to be beams that are perfectly straight, but that's not what you're seeing. You're seeing that they're bending out and into these, which are electrodes, and contacting these electrodes. They're not supposed to contact these electrodes. Okay, you can also have a warping of film. So you could sort of see here, uh, this is meant to be a large tunable capacitor. It's held up by these springs, but look at what's happening to these springs. They're sort of warping out of the plane of the substrate, okay, which is not a good thing. And that's all happening because of residual stress. And so why does residual stress happen? Well, usually associated with growth processes. So if it's a non-equilibrium equilibrium deposition, so you have a morphology change with thickness, uh, you can entrap gases, doping. So if there's anything that makes the... Uh, uniformity from the bottom of the film to the top of the film, not perfect. Grains are larger at the top than the bottom of that source. You can introduce a stress gradient through the film that we're going to go through all the mathematics for will bend that film up. Okay, and you can predict how much that bending will happen. Thermal stresses are another reason. So when you're depositing films at high temperature, Okay, what happens? You deposit it at that high temperature. At that high temperature, everything is under no stress, right? There's zero stress. But when you take it down in temperature, what happens? Everything starts shrinking, right? If your film doesn't shrink at the same rate as your substrate, which is going to be the case if they're different materials, which is generally the case, then you've got some tension between all that, compression or tension, right? So there's stress between that, and that now can cause warpage of the wafer itself or warpage of your devices. So that's what's happening here. Um, and so how do you control film stress? Well, first of all, how bad is it? So in a lot of work, you're concerned about what frequency, say, a resonator takes on and that sort of thing. So here's an expression for frequency uh, for a resonator. And so this is the basic term if there were no stress. You can see that... Uh, it depends on W over L, okay? And usually W is a lot less than L here, right? But you can see the stress term here. This is W over L cubed, okay? And so this is W over L here. And you can see that the stress term can dominate here if this sigma sub R is large enough and if this W over L is such that W is much less than L, okay? Because W much less than L makes this a very small term compared to this, right? A small term cubed is an even smaller term, so this becomes a very small term. This, though, remains a large term. Okay, so we're looking at situations where if we can't control the stress, devices even like this, which is sort of the workhorse of the industry for a lot of things, these folded beam type things, they won't work either. Um, how about tensile versus compressive stress? So what does stress do to you? It buckles your, your device or it warps your wafer. Okay, so how does this happen? So under tensile stress, what does tensile stress mean? Tensile stress means that the film that you deposited wants to shrink versus the substrate. Okay, so if you think of your substrate as staying still, the film wants to shrink relative to your substrate. So in that case, if I have a film above my substrate like this, and it wants to shrink and it's held to my substrate very tightly, this is what it's going to do to the substrate it's going to make the substrate bend up, right? It's going to shrink a little bit, and as it shrinks a little bit, the substrate will bend up. Okay, so why is that such a big deal? Well, if I have a bent substrate like this, how am I going to do lithography? Okay, this wafer, first of all, bending this thing, right, it shortens the wafer by a little bit, right? And so if I'm trying to align to something here and here to a mass that's not bent, now I have alignment problems. Okay. The other thing is that a lot of lithography systems won't even take a substrate that's bent like this uh, because it can't suck that wafer down onto its uh, chuck. Okay. And so you can't even do lithography on this. Now, if you have tension in a film and it is supported by two anchors like this, then usually you don't have that much of a problem. 
right? Because the film is going to still stay nice and straight. It's just going to be under some tension, just like a guitar string. But it's still a usable film. Okay, if you're if you're relying on frequency, maybe this is a problem because that tension, just like a guitar string, is going to change your frequency. Okay, but if you don't rely on frequency, maybe this isn't a bad problem. And in actuality, uh, a lot of analog devices, accelerometers, use tension uh, to make things a little stiffer. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So that's tension, but even worse than that in terms of stress is compressive stress. Okay, compressive stress is where your film uh, wants to uh, expand versus your substrate. Okay, so if you have this film on top of the substrate, if that film expands, right, this is what it's going to do to the substrate. It's going to bend the substrate in a downward motion like this. Also problems for lithography. Uh, but it's even worse if you have a suspended film on your substrate. Okay, so if this film is suspended on the substrate, these are anchors to the substrate. Okay, so think of anchors or points that cannot move. Right? The substrate is much bigger than the structure, right? So it's holding those anchors in place. But this film wants to grow in the lateral direction. Okay? It's not going to be able to grow in the lateral direction unless it buckles like this. Okay, so this is a case, this is called buckling, where you have two anchors that are holding its ends in place. The film wants to grow, wants to stretch laterally, and the only way it could do that is to bend. And that's a problem, especially if it buckles so much that it touches the substrate. Now it touches the substrate, now you've got the friction against moving, and you have a very hard time moving this thing. Okay, so both of these stresses are important to control. And this is the ver vertical stress gradient. This is what we're about to study here uh, in great detail. It could be really bad, right? Even with all these folded flexures and that sort of thing, if you have vertical stress gradients and can't control it, this is what you get. This is what a CMOS process engineer will give you, right, if all they do is use their CMOS films and release those CMOS films. Okay, some of you may take 143 or so. We have MEMS devices on the 143 uh, layout. Uh, if you're ever able to resolve them, they probably end up bending up, right? They're bending up because 143 is a CMOS process. Well, it's an NMOS process. The, the main thing in 143 is to make the NMOS work. And it's not to worry about whether these films are stress-free. And as a consequence of that, you could see all the MEM structures just bend right out of the plane of those things. That's because it wasn't designed to support the MEM structures. Uh, so let's talk about stress a little bit. So stress in polysilicon films. Why do we have vertical stress gradients? Uh, a lot of it has to do with how the film is grown. Okay, so films are initially amorphous. Right? When they're, well, when you, it depends on temperature in this case. If you're depositing it less than 600 degrees C, which is what a lot of MEMS people do, my group does this now, uh, the films are initially amorphous and then they crystallize. Um, you get equiax crystals, right? which means it's largely isotropic. You don't have one direction dominating. You get crystals that are sort of random all over the place. The crystals have a higher density, which means they're packed a lot more, and so you get tensile stress. All right, so what do I mean by that? So if this is the edges of, say, a beam that I have here, I have tiny little crystals like this. And they're packed very close together. Okay? Since they're packed close together, maybe they want to be smaller than the, silicon, than the substrate around it. Okay? That's opposed to if you deposit at temperatures greater than 600 degrees. So if I deposit at temperatures greater than 600 degrees, columnar crystals can grow during deposition. So what does that mean? That means the, the, the crystals are very large. Right? So at low temperature, you get fine grain crystals. At high temperature, you get large grain. And, and columnar means they may even be like this. Okay? Go all the way through the thickness of your film. And so what happens when they go all the way through the thickness of the film? Well, they have some ruggedness, right? And so they don't exactly line up. So they have this space between it, right? Which means in the end, it wants to get bigger than your substrate does. So this is how compressive stress happens. So usually, you get tensile stress with low temperature. You get compressive stress with high temperature. Okay? And so we better end up. It's 331. So, Again, no lecture on Thursday, but lecture on Friday 
uh, at 3 o'clock in two Lacans, uh, where we'll finish up surface micromachining. Okay, you have a homework due today, give it to me now, or put it under my office door uh, later on tonight at 7 o'clock, right? <laughs>